So today we'll be covering data structures. We, we discussed them briefly already last week, so I hope you guys are already thinking along the correct lines um, coming into today. But then also we, um, let me switch this off quickly. Um, we we've had some extra reading to do last week, right? So before before I proceed with this, could any of you post in the chat? What do you think the, you can post any one of the four, um, but remember I said that I would like you guys to know the names of the four data structures we would be learning. Um, does does anyone feel confident enough after the extra reading to say, to name one of these data structures? So this starts on page 70 of your textbook. So while we're doing this, um, open up on page 70. Interesting signatures and scribbles, good stuff. Anyone feel confident? Okay, you know what, I'll start with a brief description and then and then we can get into this whole naming process, okay. So, yeah, let's start by just discussing what data structures are and then I think you guys might feel more confident to name a few, all right. So data structures are the different ways a computer can store data and I put plural there. Okay, so data is a plural word. Let me, I'll actually show it to you rather than you just taking my word for it. Yo, some nice assisted underlining there, a little too late though. Okay, so facts and, facts and statistics collected together for reference or analysis. Okay, so data is just a bunch of facts and figures, but it's plural. Okay, facts, plural, lots of facts, lots of figures. Ooh, unlucky. Um, just got home from school. Yeah, I know you guys have crazy school schedules now. Hey, Rosa Fultz as well, and, and Crawford actually. Um, very, very long days. So yeah, sorry about that. But at least it's only, it's only once a week, right? Um, so we've got a bunch, so it's a bunch of facts and figures, but plural, all right? Lots and lots of data, more than one, more than one. So a computer, um, data structures are how a computer can store all of these facts and figures. So you guys know how to store one fact or one figure, right? We would use, we would use a variable for that. So let me give you guys a quick example. If I wanted to store one integer, for example, I want to store one number, negative or positive, no decimal places. Then I could say something like int x equals whatever the number is, right? Let's say six, right? That's how I could store one um, number. Does anyone want to tell me how, what do I do if I want to store more than one? How would I store a lot of numbers or a lot of strings, right? If I wanted to store one string, so like one fact, if you like, I could say that, right? Something along those lines. How do I store more than one, guys? So what's this first data structure? And you already know this data structure, in fact. You already know this data structure. How do we store more than one thing? We learned about it earlier on in the course. Does anyone remember what they were called? We were asked about it a lot in the first section. Make sure my audio is loud enough. Anyone, how would I store more than one number here? I can understand if you guys are feeling tired, long day at school. Let's see though. Have to have to get the juices flowing because because it is these these data structures can get quite quite intense. But it is interesting though. I think gives you nice intuition into how computers work. Ah, uh, if I tell you the name, you'll hit yourself, guys. How do I store more than one integer here? What would let me ask you that. What would I add off arrays or data structures? Precisely. So arrays are the first data structure that we learned about, right? It's how to steer, store more than one thing. Okay. So yeah, um, well done, well done, Saham, and whoever was writing at the bottom of the screen there, I see you also. Um, cool. So it's how to store more than one thing, right? So I might have a string, an int, a double, for example, right? String, int, double. Those are just variable types, right? They're a type of a single thing. When we're talking about data structures, we're talking about many strings, many ints, many doubles. How do I just store lots of these things? All right, which can be, I hope you can see quite a difficult thing, right? Because it's difficult to encode in a computer 
what what this means it's it's like quite a complicated task um, but there are lots of different ways for us to do this there it, there are much more data types in the world than this but in c sharp these are the main ones and these are the ones that we're covering in the course these are the ones you need to know okay we will be discussing four data types all right four of them the first one you've already named arrays all right the other three are all in the understanding data structures section does anyone want to name another of these three um, if you're if you're comfortable with the reading how in fact you have heard when we were discussing recursion you heard about another data structure um, where you did hear about another data structure when we were covering recursion I don't know if any of you will remember the names Ah, okay, so Saham names a Q. That's a good one. Yeah, that's another data structure, Saham. That's good. That's good. Ooh, well, in a way, a string is kind of a list of chars, so that's that's correct. But but um, not it's it's not the data structure. It's not a data structure. We would consider a string another variable. Okay, Q is good. Saham, you say stack. That's that's good as well. That's correct. Stacks you have heard of before. All right. Those, those are the ones we discussed during the recursion lecture. Um, don't worry if you don't remember that at all. Um, we'll, we'll discuss them in more detail now. And the last one, I'll, I'll just tell it to you, is linked lists. Exactly, linked list. Okay, so those are the four data structures we're going to be learning about. Arrays, queues, stacks, and linked lists. Okay, now you see the word list here. I remember when we were discussing arrays, we would often call, we would often think of it like a list or or a collection. So a collection is good, like arrays and collections. Those things should mean the same thing in your mind. It's like a collection of things. That's what an array is. But linked, but the word list means something different in computers. Okay, the word list means has a different meaning in computer science. Arrays and lists are not the same thing. So we'll discuss the difference between those. Okay. And about each of these four, we're going to go quite in depth. All right. We're going to answer five questions about each of these. So these are the five questions that you're going to need to be able to answer about each of these um, data structures. All right. Or rather what that you'll be able to answer by the end of the by the end of these slides. Whether or not we'll finish them this week is another question. How does the computer represent the data structure? So what is the computer's internal representation, right, in memory? So that's getting quite technical, but hopefully you'll see it makes a lot of sense how these things flow into each other, all right? The next question will be, how do we create the data structure? So for example, you know how to create arrays, and we'll see that on the next, on the next slide, um, but you know, how do I actually create a queue in, in C Sharp? How do I create a stack in C Sharp? How do I create a linked list in C Sharp? Those, those questions will be able to answer. Next, how do I access items in the data structure? So you know how to do this with an array, right? You put the square bracket after the name of the array and you put the index you wanna access, right? And we start counting at zero. You guys know how to do this with arrays. If you weren't comfortable with that previously, then definitely pay attention now because we'll cover it now as well. So how do we access items in the data structure? How do we manipulate the data structure? So that's like saying, how do I add another item to the data structure or change an item in it? How do we like work with it? What, how do we actually use it? So that's um, the next question we'll answer. And the last question is, when would we use this particular data structure? Because looking at all of these, you might go, well, arrays can store a bunch of different things. Why do I need queues, stacks, and linked lists? Why do all four of these exist? And you'll see that there's subtle benefits to each of them that make them better than the others in certain cases and worse than the others in certain cases. So we'll discuss, um, we'll discuss those cases and, and that idea. All right, I know it might look quite scary, but there's a lot, there's a lot of animations in, in this lecture as well. Um, so we'll try to keep it going and also just um, yeah, we'll we'll take lots of breaks. I know this this is hectic, but remember that this is first year computer science content. Like by the time you finish section three of this textbook, you'll you'll be totally down for first year comsci at university. 
So that's pretty cool. All right, so we'll begin by discussing arrays. All right, this is kind of revision because we have seen this all before, but we're going to go a little bit more in depth this time. Um, have a slightly better understanding of what arrays are. And you can see nice and highlighted in gray at the top left there. Okay, so uh, let me see. Ah, if you, yeah, if, feel free to ask a question. Um, go ahead. Unless I, I know some people raise their hand accidentally. Apparently, it's quite easy to do accidentally. Um, an array is a collection of items of the same type stored in contiguous memory. All right, two big new words here, homogenous and contiguous. Okay, so you know we have types in programming, ints, doubles, um, strings, all of these kinds of things. Everything inside an array, right? Because an array is storing multiple things, multiple, um, a lot of data, right? It's storing multiple things. Um, all of those things in an array are of the same type. Okay, so we say it's homogenous, homogenous. Everything's the same. They're also in contiguous memory, which means in the computer's memory, they are literally all stacked up next to each other. Okay, if you don't understand the definition, there'll be nice pictures on the next slide. Um, that'll help you understand um, what what these two words mean. For now, we're going to focus on answering just those first those first few questions. All right, these first few questions. Cool. So um, here on the left, we've got what you might see as an array. Okay. This this array has four items in it. Okay. The items are five, six, three, and four. Okay. Those are the items in our array. This is an array of ints, we can see, okay? If we, the, at position zero, it's holding the integer five. At position one, it's holding the integer six. At position two, it's holding the integer three. At um, position three, it's holding the integer four. That is a lot of hand raising going on. Um, is this a big question then? Okay. Um, and just another example of, of an array here on the left, we've got dog, cat. Okay, those are the two items. Those two items in this array, we start counting at zero. Position zero is the string dog. Position one is the string cat. Okay, so let's answer this first major question. How do we create an array? How do we create an array? Um, and again, this will be revision, so we'll move through it pretty quickly. Hopefully, hopefully you guys um, manage to follow quite nicely. Okay. So um, you can see I've listed two ways to create an array here. Um, again, guys, remember that when you're tested on these concepts, you're tested in multiple choice. So you don't have to worry too much. All right. You don't have to worry too much, which is quite a nice thing. Um, but about about being able to develop like a perfect app yourself yet. Um, focus more on understanding the theory of what's going on, but I do like showing you that the actual that it actually works in C sharp, that it's not just made up, All right? So we're going to create these two arrays. I'm going to create them using both different techniques. Okay, I'll create these two arrays using both of these techniques that we use to create arrays. All right. Oh, by the way, um, actually, I'll tell you during the break because you might get distracted. So, so let's do this first. All right. So the first array, guys. What is the first array's type? What is the first array's type? You can see I've I've defined a little template here for how to create a new array. Two different. It's an int. Good stuff. All right, and and we can see it has four elements. So let's just go ahead and create um, this first array. All right. So one way I might do it is a way you're familiar with. Right. I'll say int. Put some square brackets after it. So obviously, if I just said int, then that would mean an integer, right? Just one integer. If I put the square brackets after it, it's a collection of integers, correct? So we say int with the square brackets, a collection of integers. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call my array numbers. You could call it whatever you want, nums perhaps, but, but whatever you like is fine, right? And then we say equals. And in curly brackets, I just put the list, the list that I want this, this array to have. So it'll be 5, 6, 3, 4. Okay, 5, comma, 6, comma, 3, comma, 4. All right. And so now I've created 
the array that we have in the slides here. Okay, five, six, three, four. Um, in position zero is five, position one is six, position two is three, position four, I mean, um, yeah, position three is four. Um, it is a bit confusing. Remember, we start counting at zero, All right? Let me, let me do it that way. So it's perhaps simpler to see. This is position zero, this is position one, this is position two, and this is position three. Okay, exactly like we have it in the slides, All right? So that's the first way, and we've seen this way of creating an array, right? This is, but you see, when I created this array, I had to know the exact things that were going into the array, right? I had to know that it was going to be five, six, three, and four, right? You guys can see that. I had to know what was going to go into the array. Oh, so Ham, did you try to do your standard super long message? Did it edit out the spaces? Ha ha, another advantage of Zoom. Okay, so the how would I create this array if all I knew is um, what, how many integers I had? So like, for example, I knew that I wanted to hold four integers, but I wasn't totally sure if they were gonna be five, six, three, and four, or some other combination of numbers. Right, so I want an empty array that can hold four integers. Okay, so we've got this second array here, right? Um, do you, can you guys remind me what what array what is this array holding? What is its type? What is its type? Strings, exactly. There are two strings in this array. But what if I didn't yet know that I wanted the strings to be dog and cat? I knew that I wanted two strings but I didn't know what they were yet, right? So for example, if I have a hundred, um, I know that I have a hundred people coming to an event and I want them to fill in their names, but I don't know their names yet. I just know that there's a hundred people and I know they all have names. So I want place to store the names. I could create an empty list that will hold a hundred strings, okay? So that is what this first way of creating an array is. So I'm gonna create two strings. I'm gonna, or rather I'm gonna create an array that can hold two strings. Okay, so let me show you that. What I'll say, you see we've got a list on the right here in our integer array. That's when I already knew what I wanted. So I'll say string, curly brackets, names. Okay, or, or whatever, I, I'll just say, um, you know what I mean, words, all right? So they're just strings, I can name I can name it whatever I want, right? Um, what I wanna show you is, is that there's two ways to do this, right? So I can do it the way we did the first one, right? I know that I, I, if I know I want this to hold dog and cat, I could say dog and then I could say cat, right? So now um, this is position zero, this is position one, and we've got an array of strings that holds dog and cat. Got that? What does this say? Not sure. Okay, um, now, what if I don't know that I want it to be dog and cat? I just know that I want to hold two strings. So I'll say new string two. Okay, so that's the size of the array. And now what the computer's doing here is actually very interesting. Okay, and we'll see it on the next on the next slide, because I, I want to build up to it so that you understand how to program it, and, and then we'll discuss what's what's actually occurring. Um, and then with the, with the later data structures, we'll, we'll go through it in a different way. It's just because these ones we're revising, okay? But what the computer is doing here is is actually quite interesting, and, and we will see it on the next slide. So with with arrays, you have to know the size and the type, okay? You have to know the size and the type. You see this array here, it can only hold strings. It can only hold strings. This array here can only hold ints. And it can only hold the specific size that you gave it, right? When I created this with four integers, holding four integers, it can only hold four integers. I created this to hold two strings, it can only hold two strings. So let's quickly get through the next two questions because I imagine this might be boring you because you already know what arrays are, you know how they work. Um, or at least you know how to program them slightly. So um, we don't have to spend too much more time on this. 
So what I'm going to show you is just the answers to the next few questions, just for those of you in the class who forgot. Okay. So here I've got how to remember. We were, ask, we were asking a few questions. How do we create the array? Answer that. How do we access the array? This one I hope you remember. Right, we just specify the name and then the index we want to access. So let me let me do that. I'll, I'll show you that here quickly. So numbers is holding four things, right? Five, six, three, and four. If I say num, I want to let's say I want to print out one of the numbers. I'll say console dot right line. All right. Numbers in, and I put a square bracket to specify a position. Guys, I want to get six out of this array of numbers. What, what position will I access if I want to get six out of this array? One, precisely. So that's how, cool. I'm, I'm glad you guys, you guys are comfortable with this. Yeah, we have covered that quite a lot. Um, so yeah, that's good stuff, guys. And so you know that we start counting at zero, um, and that's, that's how we access arrays. All right. I want you guys to also know words here. This the second array that we created here. It's empty, right? It doesn't yet hold any anything. It just knows that it's gonna it has enough space to hold two strings. Okay, it has enough space to hold two strings. We haven't told it what those strings are yet though. Okay, it just has enough space to hold two strings. So if I said words in position zero, for example, that would be accessing the first place it can hold a string, right? It's called words. If I access words in position zero, that's it, it will return like I, I can let me just show you. Let me just show you actually. So I'm gonna uh, how do I get oh right, I'm just super zoomed in. So you see it does run, but it doesn't print out anything. You guys see that? <coughs> so the position is empty, it's an empty string. It's like this. I'll show you. It's it's like that. Okay, it's just an empty string holding nothing. So, um, but it has enough space for a string. That's the point. All right. So um, let's just, cool. Uh, we were comfortable with arrays, it seems. And the last question we want to ask, ask about arrays before we get on to the, the two more complicated questions. What is the internal representation and when do we use them? Before we get on to those questions, I just want to discuss um, the last thing of how to actually change the array. Okay, how do I actually change it? And and this is a this this is quite a big concept for arrays because it'll show you why we do need other techniques for storing things. Okay, so concentrate on this bit. All right, if I want to change the three to a two, all right, I want to change the three inside numbers to a two. I would do that by saying numbers in position, so this is 0, 1, 2, right? So numbers in position 2, that's where the 3 is, okay? Equals 2, okay? And now this would be 5, 6, 2, 4, okay? Um, and yeah, I could change it to anything I wanted. If I made it 4, then it would be 5, 6, 4, 4, okay? 0, 1, 2, 3, okay? So that's how we change an entry in an array. And I can do that with the words array as well, right? I could say words in position zero equals dog, for example. And I could say words in position one equals cat. Okay. And so now that words array would be holding dog cat exactly like we have here. Okay. Now, what I want you guys to notice if I want the array to be larger, right, I can't say words in position two, right? This is not allowed. I can't say numbers in position um, four, right? That's not allowed because this ends at three. This ends at, at one, if you like. It's, it's only got enough space for two things. This only has enough space for four things. So if you go outside of that, things will break. So how do I make my arrays bigger? I would have to create a new array and like copy everything across, which hopefully you can see is very inefficient, right? I just want to add another number. What if I just want to make, I want to add a five, right? I want numbers in position four to equal five. 
it's going to tell me no numbers in position four does not exist numbers in position four does not exist and this will break right it'll say index range out of bounds okay range out of bounds so um this will break is is the important thing we need to grasp there okay so you'd have to create a totally new array which is quite inefficient so for now let's leave that there and let's get onto the animations and the new stuff that was in a way just revision but hopefully some of you guys found it beneficial i know some people um probably weren't maybe weren't 100 percent on arrays yet so now it's onto this new stuff and yeah concentrate here because it will be it might be pretty um pretty new to a lot of you a new way of thinking if you like so let's do this all right so we've got this array here okay five six three four i want you guys to think back to what the definition of an array was we said it was in contiguous memory and that it's homogeneous okay so what does that mean homogeneous all of the numbers are this all of them are the same type every item in the array is the same type if it's an array of strings then everything in the array is a string if it's an array of ints then everything in the array is ints okay so when i say that it's in contiguous memory what i mean is it looks something like this okay we've got the computer's memory all right we've got the computer's entire memory that's just like this whole box here is the computer's entire memory okay over here where this red bar is is some things that i don't have access to okay i don't have access to this memory it might be used to be it might be running something else right it might be running your browser or whatever it's it's doing something right i don't have access to this oh you guys are getting very familiar with the zoom animation things i see and on the right here we have um, another piece of memory that i don't have access to i don't have control over Are those question marks because you want me to explain more or or are you still following okay so um cool Ooh, let me just see so if i ah yeah it's fine okay stop with the drawings i i think i can turn them off they can be quite nice when eventually they get a little bit boring maybe and then the people will start um actually highlighting the important things that we're covering rather than just drawing um so yeah hopefully wow this is getting a bit crazy usually they disappear not sure why flurs it okay hopefully they start disappearing at a slightly faster rate anyway so um let me let me get back to this so um in contiguous memory what we mean is we've got our array here right five six three and four and then we've got the entire computer's memory all right so the computer's memory is um right the red bits are parts that we can't access but what i want you to pay attention to is that five is next to six is next to three is next to four okay they are all in contiguous memory they're next to each other all right so this is like our array here five six three four is our array and then all of this memory on the side is not ours okay now um just as like a little exercise it's i think it's on like page nine of your textbook maybe can one of you tell me how large um an integer is how many bits is there in an integer or how many bytes how many bits or bytes are there in an integer hmm is that it let's go see so there is on it's all on page nine of your textbook guys there's a nice table let me check it out okay we say four bytes all right yeah that's that sounds correct to me and yeah four bytes four bytes it is okay four bytes how many bits are there in a byte guys how many bits are there in a byte eight cool so how many bits is a single integer all right how many bits is one integer 32 exactly four times eight right cool 
So now, hopefully you can see why the computer needs to know the exact size of the array, right? If I have an array that stores four integers, the computer needs to know that it's storing four and it needs to know the type. It needs to know that it's storing four integers. So then it can go ahead and go, all right, you'll need one, two, three, four slots in memory of 32 bits each, right? So 128 bits is our array. Okay, so the computer needs to know exactly, exactly how large the array must be because you see, it's not gonna give you access to this memory on the side. All right, so we asked for four integers. An int is 32 bits, right? So we are, ex we are reserved or 128 bits exactly is reserved for our array, all next to each other. Okay, in the computer's memory. All right, hopefully we understand. Yo, that's not particularly helpful. Um, all right. Yeesh. You like Zoom. I mean, that's good, but at this rate, we might have to turn off these animation things. This is getting a little bit too crazy. Um, okay, so, um, all right. So this allows for instantaneous access. So what I wanna show you, yeah, I, I, I will, if can have one, we can have one more t chance, I think. Okay, so this allows for instantaneous access, why? Now, guys, what's nice about this is it'll help you understand exactly why we start counting at zero. Okay, look, so we've got five, six, three, four. When the computer's trying to find out what you want to access, what it'll do is it'll say the index you give it. Okay, so let's say I gave it one. Yeah. So let's say I give it one. So I give the, the computer one. I want to access position one in the array. Okay, so that's going to be six, right? What it's going to do is it's going to say, one times 32, okay? Remember, an, an integer knows that you're storing integers, so it knows that they're each 32 bits. So this five is taking up 32 bits, the six is taking up 32 bits, the three is taking up 32 bits, the four is taking up 32 bits, okay? So when it says, so when you say, I want to access position one, the computer will go one, times by the size of an integer, 32, so one times 32, and it'll go ahead and it's gonna access pos position 32 in memory or whatever the start of your array is plus 32. And then it'll get to six. And you see it can do that immediately. It knows exactly where in memory that part of your array is. Okay, if you don't get that yet, don't worry, we discuss it again later. But it says it, it al this allows us for instantaneous access, okay? It allows instantaneous, very fast access. We'll explain it in more detail later though if, you, if you're not comfortable with it now. The important thing about why arrays can't be used in every case is what if I actually wanted to store five numbers, right? Here I've got four, what if I wanted to store five? Well, you see, I don't have access to this place in memory. The array needs to be contiguous. So I can't just take a little block from this because this memory might be being used for something else, okay? So I would need to create a totally new array and copy everything across, okay? So I'd have to create a new array with five spaces in memory, copy the five into position one, the six into position two, the three, etc. right? I'd have to copy everything across and then I'd have my extra one spot, which is very slow. So when do we use an array? This is its internal representation. When do we use it? We use it when we are certain about the amount of data we are storing or you are accessing the data very frequently, okay? So if I am accessing six and three very frequently and five and four, if I'm accessing all these numbers very frequently, then I'd want to use an array and also if I knew exactly how many I wanted to store. Okay, so I knew I wanted four numbers and I wanna access them frequently, then I use an array. If, those, if that's not the case, 
then we have to start considering other options. Okay. Don't worry, we'll come back to this internal representation and deal with it more. It's the one we'll cover in the most detail. But for now, um, let's, let's just move on to the beginning of queues. Queues should be quite easy for a lot of you, you, a lot of you to get because I'm sure you, everyone spent a bunch of time standing in queues before. Yeah, yeah, um, arrays are used very frequently. Yeah, very frequently. Um, but so are, so are the other things. It very much depends on what you are using the program for. Okay, so um, a queue, so hmm, it's, it's basically what a queue is in, in the real world, on, honestly, it's, it's very similar. A queue is a collection of items stored in memory. Okay, that's what a data structure is, basically. Collection of items stored in memory. So we can predict that queues are also that, right? Queues are a data structure. They store data just like an array does, or, or rather, like they both store data. Arrays and queues store lots of data, but they store it in different ways, okay? Um, queues are implemented in different ways in, in a lot of different applications. But what we care about is exactly how they work. All right. Um, let me see. Do I, I do have a nice animation here. Yeah. Okay. So what we're going to do is a sort of worked example. I think we should probably take a break first, though, um, because, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do our break now. It's a little bit earlier for a, a little bit early for a break. Um, but let's let's take a break now um, before we get into queues. Okay. So I think let's do two. Um, 1548, all right, so 10 minute break. 10 minute break, and um, then we'll be back, all right. Because I do just want to, um, you know, work through it consistently rather than, Yo, you guys really do like the animation thing. I mean, no, that that is good though, ooh. That's interesting. Huh. That you can turn that on. Oh, you see, that's quite cool. So now it shows your name, so we know. There's now accountability, you see. Anonymity is a dangerous thing, I think. I'm just going to go get some water quick and we'll be back later. Uh, wait, why is this still here? Why has this annotation not been removed? Is it bugging in some way or something? Oh, do you actually have to erase them all yourself? Is that is that what's going on? Or does it automatically disappear? I don't know. It is pretty helpful though, I hope you guys can see. So I don't want to disable it. Obviously, there's going to be some time for where you guys are going to be playing with it a lot. Um, but eventually it can be nice and interactive, you know. So like you can circle something and put a question mark there if, if, you're, not, if you're not sure about it. Um, so it is quite a, it's quite a nice feature. Um, so I don't want to just disable it. Um, but yeah, please, please don't be too bothersome were like wow during the lecture with it well then obviously we'd have to okay i'm just gonna go get some water quick i'll be back now and yeah we'll start again at 1548 okay
Yeesh, that's gotten pretty chaotic, eh? <laughs> Wait, I can't even see the chat anymore. Ah! <laughs> All right, interesting. I think that was even making my computer a little bit like warmer because it was so much. Bob. Surprisingly neat handwriting for, for touchscreen definitely beats mine. Remember when I was trying to use that that Zeitboard thing during the recursion lecture. You guys you guys were having a proper laugh at my zeros and writing. Ah you have a stylus, okay. You have a lot of homework. Well this is a good way to procrastinate doing your homework. Which is nice. Yeah, I think the schools are really trying to salvage this year. I mean, what would you guys prefer? I mean, did you see Kenya recently just cancelled the entire school year? So you just go back next year and it's like an extra year of high school, basically. Um, so this year was just a write-off, basically. That's better. Okay. You guys do agree with that. All right. That's it's inter it's interesting that you guys agree um, with with that idea. Yeah, I think it's a little bit crazy to do these ridiculously long um, school hours because it is kind of unsalvageable. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, with an exclamation mark. Yes, with an exclamation mark. Thank Very artistic. Ah, colouring is correct now as well. Good contribution. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Yes, good way to spend the break instead of getting water and stuff. Um, let's get started now, erase all this nonsense. Um, let me see, well I have to do it. I'll have to keep myself armed with an eraser from now on. Okay, awesome. So, cues, they work a lot like how they work in the real world. The technical details of how they're implemented in each language we don't really care about. We care about the general overview. So how we're going to go through this is a worked example. Okay, so we're going to actually create a queue. We're going to add things to a queue and actually play with it in Rex Tester. Okay, so let's start by doing that first thing. Okay, we're going to create a queue. Queue, the name of our queue equals new queue. Very simple. That's how you create a new queue. Okay, so I'm going to go over to Rex Tester. I'm going to type basically exactly this except obviously I'm going to replace name with the name of the queue that I want. Okay, um, does one of you guys want to name name our queue? What should we call it? All right, notice guys, I'm going to remove generic here. So we say using system.collections, I'm going to remove generic. Okay, queue is called Bob. Good, good one. Okay, so queue Bob equals new queue. Okay, that's how we create a queue, right? Queue, um, the name equals new queue, um, and and that'll be fine. And let me let me just show you so that you you believe me. See, it runs. That's how we create a new queue. Okay, and nice and easy to remember, right? Um, it makes sense, like like a lot of the pro programming language. Um, it it all it all makes sense, right? That's how we create a queue. And you could make you could put whatever your name pickle rick should be the name we can't have spaces in names remember so we could say something like pickle underscore rick like that would be fine or with a capital r we could use camel case something like that can work um, but remember no spaces uh let's let's settle on rick okay because we also want our variable names to be quite short right because um easier to type <laughs> okay cool so we we run that all right we create a new queue all right what that does in in the computer is it goes okay it's going to create a structure of arbitrary length okay i put dot 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 here because we we don't really care about the technical details of how much space C sharp reserves for this or how it all works. Okay, um, we what we care about is more just a general understanding for how this works. Okay, and what it will do is all of this memory will just be empty. Okay, you see it says null, 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 null. It's all empty, it's got nothing in it. All right, but there are two important things a head and a tail. Head and tail. Okay, both of them for now are pointing at the first location. Okay. It's all empty, but there is like a starting point, if you like. Um, the starting point is what's defined by the head. Okay, So the head points to the start of the queue, and the tail points to the end of the queue. Okay, Makes sense. The head points to the start of the queue, the tail points to the end of the queue. But currently there is no start or finish, right? There's nothing in it, it's just empty. So the head and the tail are pointing at the same thing. Hopefully we're happy with that. All right, so that's us creating a new queue. And you might say, well, why did we do this? This seems silly. Um, it's holding nothing. Um, but now you'll see why why we did it and how we use it. All right, so we've answered the first question. How do we create a queue? Queue, the name of the queue, equals new queue. And that gives us this kind of structure. Okay. Next question. How do we actually manipulate the queue? Okay. There are two or let's say three important commands that are important with queues. The first one is nq, nq. So you say our queue's name is Rick. Um, you could have called it Bob or Mark or whatever you wanted, or you could have given it an actually you know good name for a queue. We settled with Rick. Um, so we'll say Rick dot nq. So Rick Rick dot nq, and then whatever we want to put in our queue. 
um, and we could put anything in our queue because our queue can have different types. Remember, the array all had to be of the same type. It had to be strings or ints or doubles. Um, whatever you were holding in your array, everything had to be the same. It was an array of ints, an array of strings, or an array of doubles. In our queue, we can hold any, any type we want, really. You can put whatever you like in the queue. Okay, and how you add something to the queue is you use this nq thing. So nq it, you put it in the queue. That's what this is meaning, okay, nq. So um, let's do it. Let's actually try that. We're going to say our, na our queue's name is Rick, all right? So we'll say rick.nq, um, and I want Rex test. You see it auto-completes for me. Rex, um, Rex tester C sharp knows what this means nq and it's asking for for a thing okay so there we go nq okay rick.nq and what do you guys want to put in our queue guys give me give me a thing to put in the queue it can be a string it can be an int it can be a double it can be your i don't know whatever you want so does anyone put pickle in the queue okay but um so how i think it's uvia right who said pickle Remember, pickle is a string. So how would I actually type it here? Pickle is a string. So how would I actually type it? Right, right. We're going to need those quotation marks, right? So we'll say something like pickle. Okay, yeah, precisely. So we'll say pickle like that. And that's going to add pickle to the Rick queue. Okay, rick.nq pickle. So pickle will be in the queue. And so what will that look like? All right, here I just used dog. I was being boring, had a normal queue. Ours obviously says pickle instead. Hopefully that doesn't confuse you. Um, so I'm not going to change pickle to dog. We'll leave it as pickle. But but yeah, understand like, you know, ours doesn't say dog. It says pickle. Whatever you add to the queue will appear in the first location. And the head and the tail of the queue are still pointing at the same place, right? Because the start and the end of the queue are the same because there's one thing in the queue. Hopefully we can understand that, okay? But we can add more stuff to the queue, right? Do you guys want to add another thing to the queue? Does anyone have any options? What what should we add to our queue, guys? Remember, it doesn't have to be a string. You can pick any number you like. And we can add it to the queue. 3847382, let's do that then. So we'll say rick.nq, and we'll put a three eight four seven three eight two uh i think i typed it correctly cool and now we've got pickle and then we've got three eight four seven three eight two okay something relevant cool okay so we've got our two our out we've now got two things in the queue okay and we can see that here so what would that look like now obviously ours is pickle and then three eight four seven three eight two it isn't five Okay, so ours is pickle and that long number that Saham suggested. Um, here we're just using five. So now the head is pointing to pickle and the tail is pointing to 3847382. And there's no reason to stop there, right? We could add another thing to the queue. And then what will happen? So what I want you guys to notice, the head and tail were initially pointing to dog, right? They can then point to tail. The the, when when we add another thing to the list, the tail moves. Okay, the tail is now pointing at five. If I add another thing to the list, it's pointing at the last thing in the list. Um, Saham, so for our purposes, yes. Just say yes. Obviously, the computer is only finitely big, so you can't actually hold infinitely many things. Um, but yes. Um, the, the space doesn't matter. We don't care about how C Sharp actually does it on a technical level. Different languages do it in different ways. What matters is how the queue works to us, okay? So what really matters is this idea of head and tail. So the head and tail will always be at, at each end. Yeah, yeah, correct. So the head is the first, the first part of the queue or the front of the queue, okay? The head is the front of the queue and the tail is the back of the queue, okay? So that's how that works. Head is the front of the queue, tail is the back of the queue. Okay, so we've so you guys see how this works. And if I added more things, you can picture how it would work, right? If I added bird, 
then tail would just move up and it would be pointing at bird. So hopefully you guys can work out how that would go, right? So the tail just moves to point at the end, okay? So hopefully we're happy with that. Cool, so now we know how to add things to the queue, but that's not all we want to do, right? You can picture if we could only ever add things to a queue, that would be pretty bad, right? We also want to be able to remove things from the queue, right? Or then we'll just have a, you know, a super long queue. So obviously the whole idea here is that things will wait and eventually they'll be removed from the queue, right? Makes sense. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we have this command nq, right? So nq, that's to go into the queue and the command dq, okay, dq. Um, close enough, <laughs> um, but yeah, like this. So D E Q U E U E. I I always forget how to spell Q. It's a, it's a weird word, but yeah, D Q. So ours will be Rick dot D Q, right? Like whatever the name of your Q is dot D Q. Um, and obviously you don't give it anything, right? Notice you don't give it anything, because what will this do? What D Q does is it goes, it looks at the front of your queue, all right? It looks at the front of your queue. It takes the thing at the front of your queue, like gives it to you. It says, look, it says dog or whatever was at the front of your queue. In our case, it'll be pickle, right? And then it goes and removes it from the queue. It dequeues it, okay? And it moves the head to point at the next thing, okay? So our first position is pickle. Our second position is 3847382, okay? So DQ will take pickle. It'll say, look, it's pickle. It'll give us pickle. It returns it to us. And then it moves head to points at 3847382. Uh, Here it removed dog and then it points to, um, to five, okay? And if I ran DQ again, then it would remove five and then the head would point at cat. And if I ran DQ again, it would remove cat. And then head would just be pointing at nothing again. Head and tail would be pointing at the same place and the queue would be empty. Okay, so that's how the queue works. It like moves along, right? Like you add things to the queue to, to add to the tail and then you remove things from the queue. Okay, you can kind of see it as working in a circle. Um, on page 72 of your textbook, they display it in a circle which also makes sense lit in like literal computer memory. It's not a circle. Um, but, but again, however you want to think of it, the point is the head and the tail like move. All right. Um, so that's the important thing. And remember that you can change the size. Like if, so just cause it's a circle, obviously if, if it was getting too big, C sharp could like give you a bigger circle hypothetically. Okay. But remember we're not, with arrays, we discussed the literal way that it's implemented. Queues are, are like a, they're a abstract idea, like on top of the computer memory. Okay, so you don't have to worry about the literal implementation of it. It's more like a conceptually how they work is what's important. Okay, so let's let's check this out with our example here. Okay, so we said we've, we've got two things in our list. I want more, one more thing, guys. So what should I add to the list? rick.nq um we've got we've got one last option what do you want to add to the list anyone have any ideas want to say hello to to the family or whatever through youtube <laughs> oh that's a long one remember we can't have spaces in our something relevant all right let's do that then something relevant something irrelevant yo we've got a we've got two two parties here I'm not sure how to keep both happy. Okay, we'll say something relevant though. All right, cool. So we've got three things in our list now, right? Pickle, 3847382, and something relevant. Now, um, when I run this, uh, let me just make sure that it doesn't cause any problems. You see it runs. So so that's that's good. Um, let me see. It's not like huge, okay. Okay, so... Uh, Hopefully that's zoomed in enough because it is a bit crazy being zoomed in that much from my side. That's fine though. Okay, so, cool. Um, so we want to try out these things. So we've got DQ. Now, now 
um, I hope you guys can see just having DQ isn't ideal, right? If I say rick.dq or whatever the name of my queue is .dq, it shows me what was on the queue and also removes it from the queue, right? Like that. See, so it moves the head to point at the next thing in the queue. You guys can see that DQ literally removes it from the queue. It's no longer in the queue. Okay. What if I just want to see what's in the queue? I don't want to remove it. I just want to see what's at the front of the queue. Just check. Like, I want to be able to look. Okay, dog is at the front of the queue. Do I want to remove it yet? Can I handle this yet? And you're correct. You must have spied it when it appeared on the slide earlier, I guess, or maybe in the textbook. But yeah, um, it's peak. Okay, peak. So you can just take a peek at the front of the queue and it will just show you what head is pointing at. Okay, so currently head is pointing at five. If I ran whatever the name of my queue is dot peak, then it will just show me it's a five. It's not going to remove five from the queue. It's just going to show me that five is there. Okay. So um, those, those are the commands that we need to know for a queue. Okay, those, that's it. It's not too complicated, right? You need to remember what the queue is doing, right? It's got the head and the tail. The tail points at the end of the queue. The head points to the front of the queue. You need to know what NQ does. It adds to the back to the back of the queue and moves tail to point to the new thing you added. DQ removes the front of the queue and moves head to the next thing in the queue. And peak just shows you whatever head is pointing at. Okay, just shows you the item at the front of the queue. Okay. So um, that's cues. I, I take it you guys are pretty okay with that, but let's let's see it in action. Okay, so we've got three things in our queue. Okay, a queue with three things. The first thing added to the queue was pickle. The second thing, 3847382, and the third thing, something relevant. So by the time we get to this part of the code where the cursor currently is, um, over here, okay, we have three things in our queue. The head is pointing at pickle, and the tail is pointing at something relevant. Okay. Now, if I say console.writeLine. Okay, so I'm going to print out what this returns. I'm going to say the name of my queue is Rick. Right. So I'm going to say Rick.peak. Okay, Rick.peak. And on the second line, I'm going to do the same thing console.writeLine and we're going to say rick.peak okay can you guys from the theory that you've learned so far i'm not sure if you're necessarily confident enough to do it yet but let's see can you guys tell me what this would print out it's going to print out two lines of course it's going to print out two lines but what would those two lines be this one will print out what? Console.rutline rick.peak will print out what? It's going to print out pickle. That's correct, if that's what you're writing there. Oh, okay. So, Saham says that it's... So, the first line is going to print out pickle. That's cool. Now, what's maybe more interesting is let's think about what the second line is doing. Remember what peak does, guys. Peak doesn't remove the thing from the queue. Right? Peak doesn't remove something from the queue. Right? It just shows me whatever's at the front of the queue. So if I run peak twice, what's going to happen? Yeah, just pickle. Exactly. Hopefully, hopefully we can get that. All right. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's correct. So here it's just going to print out the first line is going to peak. It's just going to show me what's at the head of the queue. It's going to say pickle. Pickle's at the head of the queue. But because I used peak here, when I use peak on the next line, the front of the queue hasn't changed. It's still just pickle. Okay. I just ran peak twice. I didn't DQ anything. I didn't DQ anything. So the queue didn't change. And even if I added things to the back of the queue, it's still fine. The front of the queue still points at pickle. Okay. So when I run this, Pickle, pickle. Okay. So that's working as we expect. It showed me what was at the head of the queue. Okay. Let's um, switch things up a little bit. Let's say now instead of running peak on the first line here, I run dot DQ. Now what will this print out, guys?
it's still going to print out two things, right? DQ will still print something out. Remember, it's going to give back what the head of the queue points at, and then it's going to remove it from the queue and move the head. Okay, so you guys are correct that we will now see the number, but what is actually going to happen is it's going to print out pickle. Okay, so it's going to show me what's at the front of the queue, because remember at the beginning, pick head points at pickle. So it's going to take DQ, what it's going to do, what this first line here is going to do. It's going to show me what the, what the head of the queue is pointing out, which is pickle, right? We agree on that. It's then going to remove that from the queue and move the head to the next thing, which is 3847382. And then when I type peak, that's going to show me 3847382. So what we expect here is it's going to say pickle, and then it's going to say 3847382. That's my prediction. Okay, that's that's what's going to that's what's going to happen here. Okay, so let's see that. See it prints out pickle 3847382. Okay. So it removed the difference here was remember, when we just ran peak on the first line, it did not remove pickle from the queue. So the second peak still printed out pickle. But when I used DQ on the first line, it still showed me pickle the first line, but it actually removed it from the queue. So the next time I ran peak, it, it showed me 3847382. Okay, so hopefully we understand what was going on there. DQ actually removes it from the queue and moves up the head. Okay, now maybe another tricky question. Okay, let's see what happens. What do you guys think will happen? What will be printed out if I run rick.dq and on the second line i also run rick.dq what will print out here a little bit tricky but let's see um will anyone get it pickle and then the number will it print out relevant will it print out something relevant saham you think remember i only have two print statements here right i only have two print statements Ah, so you see, it's a bit tricky, right? So this will actually print out the exact same thing as what the previous thing printed out, right? It's going to print out this first line here will print out pickle, and then it'll remove pickle from the queue. The second line will print out 3847382, just like the peak did, but it's going to remove 3847382. Okay, so it is different but the prints will be the same. So look, when I run this, so you see this is what the prints were last time. When I run it, you see they're exactly the same. They're exactly the same. But there is a difference. And so Ham, you, you somewhat saw it, but also maybe the fact that there's only two print statements maybe tricked you a bit. The front of the queue, the difference is, after running DQ the second time, instead of running peak, right? Because I ran DQ the second time, the front of the queue is now something relevant. And so when I run console.write line rick.peak, it will now print out something relevant. Okay, because now I have three print statements. And so now we've gone through the whole queue. But remember, because I ran peak on the last line here, something relevant is still in the queue. Okay. So I guys remember DQ will show you the thing and remove it from the queue. Peak will just show you it. It's not going to touch it. Peak will not change the queue. The peak statement does not change the queue. DQ does. It removes the thing. Okay. So there's a subtle difference here that I want you guys to, to be able to understand. Um, but but do, you, do you feel comfortable with it? Um, do you, are you happy with queues so far? Do you, do you like the idea? Is Are we okay? But yeah, this difference between DQ and peak is the main thing. Okay. So peak, um, so peak just shows you the thing. DQ shows it to you and removes it from the queue. And you can kind of see it in, in what the commands are called, right? There's DQ and there's peak. Peak, you're just taking a peak. You're not, 
you're not touching it or anything you're not like removing it from the queue you're not changing the queue you're just looking checking who's at the front of the queue dq you're actually you know obviously you still have to like check the person who's at the front of the queue right this thing has been waiting in the queue it's obviously there for a reason so you still have to deal with it okay so you you take the thing at the front of the queue but when you dq it you actually remove it from the queue whereas when you peek you just you only see it okay you don't you don't remove it from the queue okay subtle difference but yeah i want you guys to know the difference between those two commands all right um so hopefully you're comfortable with it if you're not then feel free to to ask of course okay but that's the second data structure that we need to get through and now there's just one more question right like when do we use queues is is the last question we have to ask about this we know what the internal representation is right we've got a head and a tail and those point to different parts of memory okay tail points to the end of the queue head points to the front of the queue okay we know how to create a queue we know how to add to a queue using nq and we know how to access a queue right we can peek to see the front of the queue and we can dq to see the front of the queue and like remove it get it out okay so we've got these these ideas right the last question of when do we use queues has quite a simple answer actually we use queues whenever we require and this might be a new term for you guys a fifo structure fifo f i f o we say fifo and what that means is first in first out okay the first thing into the queue so if we think about our example here the first thing into the queue was dog the second thing into the queue was five the third thing into the queue was cat okay the first thing into the queue is the first thing out of the queue okay dog was the first thing in and when we type dot dq it is the first thing out then five is removed um, and then cat is removed okay so whenever we require a fifo structure a first in first out structure we use a queue okay pretty simple so you just have to learn what this word fifo means first in first out and you can think about a chair like and it's exactly like a queue in the real world so just think about it that way as an example of in the real world when do we need a fifo structure if you guys have ever been to like a bank or something you know where you push a button and they give you a little ticket and they say you're number 32 or at a fast food restaurant uh hop us four hop us four um so we still got like 15 minutes um so or if you're at a fast food restaurant you'll you'll get be given a little ticket for for when your food might be ready those things will be implemented with queues right the first thing into the queue must be the first thing out of the queue okay if you guys can see so yeah a, a bank is a good example but any queue you've stood in in the real world um you know a lot of places do use like this automatic ticketing for queues now um any any of those will be using queues okay so first in first out that's what you must know all right um we do still have two more data structures left with only 14 minutes left which is a bit hectic um so ham you didn't say are, are you are you comfortable with this idea of dq and peak um are you are you happy with it do you want more time on it and anyone else if you have any questions that's the main thing with queues right the main difficult thing about queues is the difference between dq and peak and actually understanding what it means in this context right by saying dq pickle is removed from the queue by saying dq 3847382 is removed from the queue by saying peak something relevant is not removed from the queue okay it's still there okay but yeah if you understand that then then that's good that's 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 the main thing about queues okay the first thing into the queue is the first thing out to the queue so it's called out of the queue so it's called a fifo structure um fifo first in first out okay that's not the only way things can work though right we could have a last in first out structure right a lifo we could also there's obviously a lot of other ways you could do you could do a lilo or a you know all of all of the other ones a philo okay 
Um, so a Q is a FIFO. The other one that we'll be covering in this course is a LIFO, last in, first out. This you have heard of before, and they are called stacks. Now these are very well named, guys. So Qs in programming are exactly what they are in the real world, right? The first person into the queue is the first, yeah, yeah, it does. The first person into the queue is the first person out of the queue, okay? Just like in the real world, um, and here the first item into the queue is the first item out of the queue. A stack is different from that. A stack is, a stack is 64, right? A stack is 64. Um, what do you mean by 64, Yuvia? So a, st a stack is, is in the same way. So we say um, last in, first out. Okay, last in, first out. Okay, so we say a last in, first out collection of items. That's what a stack is. Okay, cool. Oh, right, for Minecraft. <laughs> yeah, where you actually, no, wait, no, 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 no. I, Yuvia, that's a fantastic example, actually. Minecraft stacks are implemented with stacks, with a stack. This is how they are implemented in Java, in fact. Um, they do use a stack. The first piece of dirt you pick up is at the bottom of your stack of dirt in your inventory. So the last piece of dirt that you pick up when you put it down is the first piece of dirt that comes out. So it is a last in first out structure. So yeah, the reason why Minecraft stacks are called stacks is because they are implemented using stacks. So while there was a joke, Yuvia, which went over my head, but but I do I, I do get what you're saying now. Like you can hold sixty four pieces of dirt or whatever in in your in each slot in your inventory. Those will be implemented with with stacks. So that's actually a fantastic example of where a stack is used. Okay. So a last in first out structure. And as I yeah Connor has just noted, um, pancakes are the best example of a stack. Okay. You put a pancake on the stack, right? You put another pancake on the stack. You put another pancake on the stack and the last pancake that you put on the stack is the first pancake that you eat. Okay. The last pancake that you put on the stack is the first pancake that you eat. And it's the same for programming stacks, except less delicious, obviously. Um, yeah, that's, that's the unfortunate bit is that you can't just program infinite pancakes in C sharp, but, um, this is how the idea works, okay? The last pancake you put on the stack is the first pancake off of the stack. And yeah, dirt is the same in Minecraft or, or wood or whatever you're picking up. It's a stack, okay? So, um, we, we do only have nine minutes left. Ooh, I'll bring the pancake back because, yeah. Um, we do only have nine minutes left. I think... I'll be nice and, and yeah, and it's not just niceness because actually it would be weird to, to finish the, ah, I mean, I think we could get through quite a lot of it though. It's not too difficult of an idea, but no, I don't want to rush it. We should take our time. So, so let's, let's call it there for today, guys. I know we're ending nine minutes early, which is. Uh, I'm, I'm being too nice, but but yeah, I, I think we, we can call it there for today. Um, let me stop sharing my screen. And yeah, next week we'll continue with stacks and linked lists. All right, so get amped for that. Um, no extra reading today. There will be extra work next week. Um, so don't um, so don't become complacent now that I've just been nice. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm glad stacks already make sense. I see. So to get through to Connor, I need to use food examples. <laughs> um, cool. All right. So yeah, see you guys next week. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your weeks. Um, good luck with your crazy school schedules and stuff. And yeah, see you next week. No, sir. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm just kidding, of course. Cool. Um, yeah. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Um. Ooh, some other people joined that I didn't mark on the 
on the register. I guess it's okay though. Um, they can. The video is recorded. Ooh. With that said, let me end the recording.